Hey there, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a snowy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the market action using the best practices of technical analysis. These are choppy days here in mid-January of 2024 after a pretty resounding bull phase in uh, November and December of last year. January feeling a little bit different. And if you have that sense, if you have that feeling that things, uh, conditions are changing a little bit, it's for good reason. If you look at the charts, and we'll talk about a number of them, right? The S&P has gone from consistently moving higher to being more sideways, right? Sort of settling into a range between 4,700 and 4,800. Breadth conditions that were euphoric, right? Extremely bullish at the end of last year, coming back a little bit. Still elevated, but not nearly as much as we saw at the end of last year. So how do we make sense of all of that? We're here to help you along. We'll share with you some of the charts that we are following to make sense of these markets. Some of the key levels that we are paying attention to and a fantastic guest, by the way. First time guest, a former colleague of mine, John Kolovis, who's the chief technical strategist at Macro Risk Advisors in the Boston area, will be coming, us, uh, coming to us and uh, sharing some of the charts he's watching right about now. With that in mind, let's get to the market recap and focus on how the markets evolved today. First, uh, I want to share with you a poll question we asked you recently. Will Meta, M-E-T-A, finish January 2024 above its previous all-time high, which is around 380? We're looking at the chart of Meta. So we're actually testing the uh, all-time high off the left side of this chart. You can see, of course, we've had this nice move higher. Short-term pattern of higher highs and higher lows, pretty impressive. The results from the poll almost mixed. 48% of you saying yes. 52% of you saying no, so it's really split between the two, and I think that's a fair assessment. I'm not surprised that that's kind of where we're at. Now, the bull case for something like Meta is a trend-following bull case, I would argue. The fact that we're seeing a pattern of higher highs and higher lows, and if you're a follower of trends, this is a market in an uptrend, right? We made a new 52-week high already in the month of January, just in the last week. We're almost making it again uh, today, but not quite doing so, but very, very close. So 380 is a hair's breadth away. I mean, literally four points uh, away from where we're at right now. So the, the possibility or the likelihood of us doing that, certainly a real, uh, a very real number. Now, here's the argument against it, right? We're recently overbought, as many stocks are. The broader market environment, very overbought. The S&P 500, the NASDAQ, all of those measures of uh, broad market strength, pretty elevated. So the question is, if we do retrench, if we do continue to chop around, do stocks like Meta, and I would bucket other leading growth names like NVIDIA and others, uh, continue to hold up? My guess would be yes. So I'd probably vote yes on that, uh, that it will finish uh, January above there. But that is not a strong yet. That is not a I feel great about it yes. That's probably more a you know, three out of ten maybe in terms of, uh, of maybe uh, the likelihood of us doing so. So... Uh, something to think about. And again, remember, what would you need to see on that chart to change however you voted? Uh, think about those levels, those lines in the sand on a chart like Meta or elsewhere. That's going to keep you on the right side of things, generally speaking. Let's get back to the broader market environment today. Nice finish to the day, right? The uh, early, uh, early, uh, I guess, half hour, first half hour of, of trading, I mean, uh, sort of choppy. And in the early afternoon, we were actually back and retesting yesterday's close but by the end of the day, pushing higher. The S&P finishing up about 0.9%. That's just above 47.80. The NASDAQ composite having a nice update, pushing above 15,000. That's up 1.4%. So names like Meta and NVIDIA, some of those other names uh, in that mega cap growth space, really getting things done today and leading the market higher, uh, to, be, to be clear. Mid caps and small caps up as well. Uh, and uh, slightly outperforming the S&P 500. That's in the terms of uh, small caps. They're all about the same, up about 0.8 to 0.9% today. The VIX, which uh, earlier in the week we talked about the VIX pushing higher, today actually coming down a little bit uh, with the VIX uh, sitting just above 14 as we wrap uh, Thursday's trading session. We're going to talk with today's guest, uh, John Kolobis, about interest rates. One of the charts we're going to talk about. We've seen a bounce higher in rates uh, in the new year, right? Uh, if you think about the fourth quarter, 10-year yield got up to around 5%, down below 4%, now pushing back above it. The 10-year yield continuing to push to the upside today, uh, up about four, uh, sorry, up to 4.14%. The long bond yield around 4.4%. The five-year yield is now back above 4% as well, around 4.05. The uh, dollar index moving slightly higher. That's another area of the market. When you think about what could change the configuration of the market, the dollar 
pushing higher would be a bit of a different feel. I think if it's similar to crude oil prices reverting higher, that'd be a different feel than we've seen uh, so far here in the last uh, in the last month or two. Looking at the commodity space, the broader commodity space uh, in the green with the DBC up about 0.6%, gold and silver ETFs both up as well, but up about 0.8%. Crude oil prices actually did move higher today with the USO up uh, about 1.7%. Natural gas has not been a particularly great place to be recently, down another 4.5% uh, for the UNG. Finally, looking at the crypto space, a lot of red. And as the equity session kind of continued on through the course of the equity session, Cryptocurrencies have come down. Bitcoin down almost 5% from yesterday's close. Ethereum prices down about 3.5%. And you can see the rest of the top 10 coins that we track on our stock charts platform, almost all of them uh, in the red today. Some of them uh, quite a bit, almost approaching double digits. You know, it's interesting with the chart of Bitcoin, we'll look at it in a little bit. But uh, my conversation re recently with Adrian Zadunczyk, certainly top of mind as I think about the pullback that we're seeing in uh, cryptocurrencies after those uh, Bitcoin ETFs finally approved at the end of last week. Looking at the 11 S&P sectors, technology number one in a very significant way, up about 2%. That's for the XLK. The industrial sector up 1.4%. Number three, communication services up 1.2%. On the downside, some defensive sectors at the bottom with utilities and REITs at the bottom of the list. Energy third from the bottom, down slightly from yesterday's close. And that's even with energy uh, prices, with oil prices uh, going higher today. Let's go to a daily chart of the S&P 500, just kind of check in on where things are at. We've talked about this purple shaded area, what I call a tactical range. Uh, and again, I use words like tactical and cyclical and secular as just, you know, kind of generalizations of time frames. So for me, tactical is like a couple days to a couple weeks. Cyclical is kind of a couple months. Secular is sort of a year plus so is the sort of general way that I would describe those time frames. That's the, the back, uh, back of the envelope uh, sort of uh, phrasing that I use. So a tactical range basically means in the short term. Over the last couple of weeks, we've settled into this range between 4,700 and 4,800. And John Bollinger, years ago, I remember uh, him sharing uh, in a presentation how a big break usually is preceded by a period of lower uh, volatility or a consolidation. And think of this as sort of the calm before the storm. We had a big move in November and December. We've now settled in over the last couple of weeks into this range between 4,700 and 4,800. We've retested those levels a couple times on both sides, which means at some point very, very soon, one of two things is going to happen. Either we break above 4,800, in which case you will hear me talking about a retest of all-time highs, uh, which is not too far above current levels, and really the likelihood of breaking above 5,000. On the other hand, if we fail to hold 4,700 on a pullback, that's where I think you need to uh, kick in uh, some, uh, some lower levels of support. Really think about what your portfolio does if and when the S&P goes to 4,600, to 4,400, to 4,100. And again, whether those are likely scenarios or not, you really need to think about where you would need to take some risk off the table, where you might want to take profits. Make sure your stops are up to date. Now is the time when things are not that bad yet uh, is the time to, uh, to do it. The momentum, of course, has really evaporated from this market. Look at the strong momentum that we saw in November and December and mid-December, the RSI above 80 for the S&P 500. Now, as we've retested 4,800 in the last week, the RSI down around 60, 65. So momentum very different right now than it was even three, four weeks ago. Uh, you know, lessening momentum, which is a little more common with market tops, where you see the market sort of holding ground while the momentum weakens. And the breadth conditions weaken. And we're going to look at that here uh, next. Within my Mindful Investor Live chart list, I have a number of different uh, charts that hit on uh, market breadth. Uh, and one of the ones that I just want to focus on is this one right here. This is actually looking at the cumulative advanced decline lines for the New York Stock Exchange and large caps, mid caps, and small caps. We have a bunch of really good breadth data on the stock charts platform. I would say it's one of the strengths of uh, stock charts as a, as a technical analysis platform. It's just the breadth of uh, breadth of breadth data, for last of a, lack of a better way to uh, to describe it, it can often be uh, a little bit of a challenge to find particular indicators you're looking at. So make sure you hit our support desk if you're looking for particular things, or look at the articles page because a lot of our commentators use this breadth data regularly. And I found early on, as I was using uh, learning to use the stock charts platform, just copying some of the experts and what they were using super helpful. You're welcome to any of the charts that I show. On, uh, on the program, of course, a lot of these are part of the Mindful Investor live chart list, and I'll show you in a minute how you can access that uh, if you've not done it before. 
Just look at the difference between the breadth on the advanced decline, or sorry, the advanced decline line on the large cap index, the mid cap index, and the small cap index. The S and P large cap breadth is still quite constructive, I would argue. Pull back a little bit, but still above an upward sloping 50-day moving average. Not really breaking down that much, uh, but pulling back a little bit off of the uh, the uh, end of December. Compare that to the mid-cap index, which has now shown a clear pattern of lower highs and lower lows, not to the 50-day moving average, but pretty, pretty close. And look at the small cap breadth data, which is actually below the 50-day moving average. And that is when I normally move things uh, below to uh, more of a neutral amber color. So real time, you're seeing me change the small cap breadth from bullish to more neutral. And I would change it bearish if we would undercut the October low, which would be uh, quite a bit of a further retracement from what we've seen so far. So this is when I talk about the breadth data being very strong at the end of last year. This is what it looks like at the end of December. All of these lines going higher. The 50-day moving average is sloping higher across the board. Now you're seeing the breadth get a little less optimal with some of these particularly smaller. The smaller you go, the less attractive it's been. And this is classic behavior during a pullback phase where institutions are lightening up on their risky investments and sort of doubling down on their less risky investments because you want to just ride out a period of market uncertainty. And this is sort of that divergence that I'm seeing uh, that I want to highlight for you as well. Another one to highlight, we're going to talk with today's guest about the percent of stocks above their 200-day and above their 50-day. I'll let John Clovis uh, describe his take on but I would just highlight that when we've gotten to the 85 to 90 percent level and then come down, that has lined up pretty well with some of these cyclical peaks that we've observed over the last 18 months. And going back even further, you'll see that phenomenon has happened in previous uh, bull market cycles as well. I don't think that's end of the world bad, but it does tell you that the conditions have gotten less optimal. The McClellan oscillator turned negative right at the beginning of January and remains very much below the zero level. And again, that does not tell you that the S&P is necessarily going down another thousand points, but it does tell you it's not going up right now. And I've learned when this indicator is in the red, meaning it's below zero, it behooves you to wait for the indicator to get back above zero. No reason to try and chase things. Once we get above uh, zero, that usually is not very, uh, it's usually pretty early in the next upswing, but it sort of uh, you know, prevents you from getting in when the market's clearly in a pullback phase. Wait for that bounce above the zero level, and that can often be a good entry point uh, for the next, uh, the next leg higher. Last one I'll tell you is the bullish percent index, and the S&P 500's bullish percent index just today moving back below the 70% level. This is something we've been waiting for, and I uh, promise to let you know when I observe that change. It's happened today. So what this is doing is it's looking at a bunch of point and figure charts, 500 of them. It's looking at all 500 S&P members and basically looking at each of their point and figure charts. Is the most recent signal a buy signal or a sell signal? And this indicator at 69.2% tells you 69.2% of the S&P 500 charts are most recently giving a buy signal. What that means is when it gets above 70%, that usually means we're at the later stages of the bullish run. So look at the highlighted in red area, which means we're above 70%. Look at the areas that it's highlighting on the chart of the S&P, and you can see that this sort of uh, happens at the end of a big move because so many things are now starting to generate those buy signals on the point and figure chart. Look at what happens after it gets below the 70 level, and that's when the red shaded area ends. And if you look, you see that it's usually a pullback phase, and that's why I'm sort of uh, thinking more weaker rather than stronger here uh, through the remainder of the month of January. And again, I think long term, the market is still probably in good shape. But in the short term, indicators like this that were very bullish now becoming a lot less bullish, I think are a cause for a concern. I mentioned this Mindful Investor Live chart list, which is a, a set of charts that I keep updated on the Stock Charts platform. If you click on the Articles tab, which you should hopefully be very familiar with, go in the upper right and go to my blog, which is called The Mindful Investor. And you will see this page here, which has all the uh, articles that I publish usually once a week uh, on my blog here. And if you click on live chart list, you can get this, uh, this set of charts. If you're a Stock Charts member, which of course you all of course should be, click on that green button to save it to your log. And that's the best way you can uh, make the Stock Charts platform really do some good work for you is have sets of charts, chart lists as we call them, uh, that are capturing some of the key themes and, uh, and ideas that you're trying to attract. So you're welcome to this set of charts. If you go to this link, you'll get the updated versions at any point uh, that I'm sort of uh, following. Just to finish off our market recap here, I do want to talk about Bitcoin. Uh, my interview recently with Adrian Zidunchik, and if you missed that, would highly recommend it. This happened uh, on Thursday of last week. I sat down virtually with, uh, with uh, Adrian. We were talking about 
Bitcoin ETFs, and uh, they ended up being approved as we were talking. Basically, we were talking during the interview and trying to check the uh, news wires as we were going. It's like, has it happened yet? I don't know, but it's really, really close. Uh, the confirmation happened after that, and then Friday was when uh, they began uh, trading. Uh, Thursday, Friday is when they began trading uh, on the exchanges. And these are all the new Bitcoin ETFs that, uh, that you probably uh, heard in the news. What Adrian mentioned, which I thought was brilliant, he said this is one of those buy the rumor, sell the news types of events, and he ended up being uh, totally right for now. What that means is, uh, you know, the financial markets are a forward-looking mechanism, right? So when something goes up, and and, and Bitcoin, other uh, any any financial market, I would argue, forward-looking, right? You're it's not pricing in what's happened up until today; it's pricing in what might happen next. That's why the stock market is one of the best leading indicators for the economy. Because investors are very good about anticipating what may be coming next. That's really what the market is designed to do. You're, you're paying for earnings that have not happened, the earnings that might happen down the road. It's all about the probability of what these companies are going to do. With Bitcoin, it's the same thing. You're sort of looking forward at what may happen. And as you think about the rally in the fourth quarter, with Bitcoin going from 24000 to 44000 I would argue that was driven in a lot of ways by optimism that Bitcoin ETFs would finally be approved. From the moment they have been approved, Bitcoin has come down very, very quickly. And that's pretty common. When it finally happens, that optimism has already been baked into the market for months. This is as Bitcoin has been bidding higher. So now you're seeing a natural retracement. So a lot of those new uh, ETFs that came out, like uh, IBIT, I think has gotten the most flows so far. That's the iShares uh, Bitcoin ETF. This is just, you know, it's been trading for about a week now, but it opened around 28 now down around 23 and change. So just in the first week of trading, it's come down quite a bit. And that's because a lot of flows are coming in, but the uh, overall, the initial, uh, the initial reaction is, uh, is going a little bit lower. I think Bitcoin prices certainly stabilized. I think this is an initial reaction to this new sort of uh, reality of Bitcoin ETFs. Overall, the long-term opportunity for Bitcoin is based on those ETFs being approved. But for now, from a technical perspective, I'm noting a chart that is now below the 50-day moving average. 40,000 is a big round number, and it is now once again in play. We hit resistance kind of where we'd expect in the, at a Fibonacci level, just below 50,000. Now we're testing 40,000. I would look to see if that can hold. The RSI as well is right at that 40 level. We break a little bit lower. We break below 40,000. I think that opens the door to further retracement for Bitcoin. Again, I think the long-term story on uh, cryptocurrencies uh, pretty optimistic, but for now, short term, it's all about giving back some of those previous gains. Just to wrap up, I want to highlight one group, uh, semiconductors. If you look at, we talked about NVIDIA and AMD earlier this week. I just want to highlight uh, monolithic power systems, MPWR, classic kind of buy on the dips or what we call a fat pitch chart. That's where you have a big run higher, a pullback to an ascending 50-day moving average. The RSI come down to just around 40 and starts to push, push higher. Semiconductors really starting to improve. When you think about groups that are thriving here in January, it's the leadership names like NVIDIA, but down the list of uh, the cap tiers within semiconductors, also some good opportunities as well. So make sure you use our scanning engine to find some of those individual names that may present some good opportunities going forward. I want to uh, remind you a couple quick announcements before we bring on today's guest, John Kolovis. And our main announcement is this. We would love to hear from you. We'd love feedback on our show here in the new year, we're thinking strategically about our YouTube channel, particularly the final bar, what we can do best to help you make sense of these markets. We'd love to know what you think about what we could do with the show, any guests that we should have on, but we especially want to know your questions. The mailbag, a little lighter than I would like. What questions are you running into as you're analyzing your own charts on the Stock Charts platform? Our email is thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We're on the Twitters at FinalBarSCTV. And of course, here on YouTube, just drop a comment below the video you're watching. We would love to hear from you, and we hope to feature one of your questions in our next Mailbag episode. I want to welcome on today's guest, John Kolovis. John's the Chief Technical Strategist at Macro Risk Advisors, coming to us from the Boston area. John, good to see you again, my friend. How are you? Doing great, Dave. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, good to see you as well. It's been a, it's been a, been a while, and it's a pleasure to see you. Uh, good to see that you're doing well, uh, navigating the winter and navigating the markets okay. Obviously, a strong fourth quarter leading into a choppy beginning of the first quarter. As you kind of sit back and take an assessment of what's happening here mid-January, what's your overall sense about where we're at after that strong fourth quarter and, uh, and a lot of strength? You know, Dave, I, I think the easiest way to explain this is I think this is how good overbought conditions resolve themselves. Hmm. You had 
just a plethora of breath thrusts in the fourth quarter of last year. Advanced decline statistics, volume statistics, even RSIs that got up to about 82 on the S&P 500. And, and the work that I've done, the back tests, showed that RSIs of that magnitude, that, that high, tend to show the market underperform itself for about one to two months, but then are back end loaded, meaning three months to a year later, gains are quite asymmetric, very powerful, almost mm -hmm. about a 90% odds of the market being higher one year later. So I think what we're seeing now, at least on the S&P 500, I think is par for the course, a good overbought condition. We're consolidating with what I think is going to be a, a, a pretty decent year ahead. I'm looking at around 5,000-ish, if not 5,200 on the S&P for, for 24. Now, when you think about the strength that we've seen, obviously we're consolidating a little bit. You have a couple of levels indicated here on the chart of the S&P 500. Where are you looking? What sort of levels would you anticipate support or how would you think about any sort of further retrenchment around these levels? That's, that's, that's a good point, Dave. So I think at first, and it's quite easy right now, it's never always this easy, but 4,700 is a good one to look at as, as a first level of support. You break underneath 4,700, you have maybe a bit of a double top in place there from a pattern perspective, right? What that will do is that projects to about where, look at that rising blue line, that, that's the 50-day moving average. That gets you to about where that 50-day is, or approximately 4,600. Now that 4,600 level, I think is quite interesting in that it's around that one-third or that 38.2 retracement of, of the most recent move. So I think that's mm. a good level of support. So my best guess, the base case is if we're, if we're going to continue to push lower, we'll probably get to that 4,600-ish level, maybe 4,550 at most, knocking on wood, uh, and then we'll be, we'll be able to push up higher. Worst case all right, is a move down to so check back to like, you get a 43 handle, handle mm -hmm. onto the 200-day moving average. For me to remove my, I guess, my optimistic view for the markets for, for 24, we'd have to actually see price action come back down into to those lower levels. Not quite there yet to make that call. There are a few things that worry me about it, but I don't think we're going to get there quite yet. Let's talk a little bit about the price momentum. Obviously, you know, conditions at the end of last year, incredibly strong, as you mentioned. Now we're starting to see some weakness uh, underneath the hood. We're looking at the uh, S&P 500 along with MACD and then the McClellan oscillator at the bottom. Talk us through this one, what this tells you about the conditions here through the first quarter. Yeah, absolutely. So basically momentum is negative here, right? We have the MACD in cell configuration. McLennan oscillator is also in cell configuration. The, the way I like to use momentum, at least in terms of the market, I don't just want to just use the MACD just on the index. I want to know what's going on from a bottom-up perspective as well. Because as we know from last year, what? It was a huge year in terms of knowing about the dynamics between what's going on the index level and what's going on beneath the surface. So from a top down and a bottom up perspective, momentum is soft and weak. Is it awful? Is it terrible? No, not yet. Are we oversold? Getting close. But I just, in this framework, all this is telling me is that, yeah, momentum is negative, but within the context of, a, of an uptrend. Um, you know, as you're looking uh, elsewhere at, uh, at, at trend, particularly the McClellan oscillator has gone from, you know, pretty constructive here into the end of last year. Also, the beginning of this year has turned uh, has turned very, very quickly. I guess what would you need to see to really get an all clear risk on sort of environment? Is there is it a is it just purely a breakout Is an improvement in some of these breadth momentum indicators, which have started to look a little bit more negative? Is it something else? Yeah, it would it would be it would be a combination of all of the above. One price is always number one, right? So we get a breakout above 4,800, that would actually complete a bull flag formation, push us pretty close to, to about 5,000 by, um, by early spring-ish, right? That would be number one. Number two, yes, momentum confirmation, the MACD, the term positive, the McLean also the term positive, get above the moving average. What I think is quite interesting with the MACD is that if it were to turn positive soon, it's still in an uptrend. It's still mm. above the zero line. That means you know, the, the 12 and 26 period moving average is still configured properly. So you get a renewed buy signal within an intermediate term uptrend. So that's what I would be looking for, at least with these indicators, for sure. Let's talk about uh, another, another measure of breadth. This is one we've quoted on the, on the show before, percent of stocks above key moving averages. It strikes me that we've come down a bit but still relatively high relative to historical standards. Does this give you confidence that the market is still strong? Yes or no, and why? 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. Confidence for sure. I'm a trend follower and we used to work together. So I'm an unabashed trend follower through and through. So I use these two indicators, not as an overbought or oversold indicator, but as a trend following tool. So when there are greater than 60% above the 200 day moving average, that's a bullish signal. Uh, and 70% above the 50 day, that's a bullish signal. When they're in unison like that, I like that. So even though we've pulled back, there's really been hardly any damage to the internal trend for the S&P 500. Now, while not shown here, if you expand that to like the Russell 3000, those statistics mm. are still favorable. And so, so from a market of stocks perspective, trend is, is still in, in, intact. So trend, trend, trend. The external trend of the market is positive. We see that in, in the chart right here. It's a good series of higher highs and higher lows since October. Decompose that look from a bottom-up perspective. You still have a pretty pretty good you know, setup here for stock selection and et cetera, et cetera. So I like this. I like how this is set up. Could it come in more? Sure. But given what's been going on, I I, I don't think this is enough to, at least yet, to uh, you know, to get too overly bearish. So what's interesting is as the market has rallied, as you mentioned, right, from late October to where we're at now, mid, mid-January, mid interest rates have been arguably a big part of that story right in the fourth quarter. You had 10-year yield go from 5% down to below 4%. Now we've switched that, and we're pushing a little bit higher here as we get ready for the first Fed meeting of 2024. From a technical perspective, what do you see on the chart of the 10-year yield, and what should we be looking for? Yeah, so on the chart here in itself, a couple things to be mindful of. The 50 day, keeping it real simple, the 50 day is somewhere right around the 180, uh, 4185 level, right? That that would be a first level of saying, okay, trend is starting to deteriorate, at least the 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 downtrend is starting to, to reverse higher. My sense is we're gonna go, we'll probably get up to about as about around the 430 area, is, is is my best guess. And if we get up to the uh, 430, which is around the the uh the, the November high or so. I think the market will be okay with that. When I say the market, I think mm. stocks and risk will be okay-ish with that. It's if if yield will just start to build value above that, then we're not just going to go down to 4,600 in the S&P. We're going to have to retrace a little bit deeper. So mm. a, a risk to my call uh, is, is this right here. So we have an inverse relationship between stocks and interest rates right now. Uh, and that's okay. And the work that I've done is so long as that, in, that inverse relationship holds, the market's not really too worried about a recessionary bear market because that's typically what happens going into a recession. Uh, yield curve starts to steepen, which is what we have. Mm. But then interest rates and stocks start to move lower together. They're not doing that. So right now, yes, interest rates, they were so oversold. And guess what? Stocks were so overbought. So mm. we're going to have this inverse relationship. And it's okay for a retracement of interest rates to reset. And that's what the market's kind of debating right now. It's the Fed pivot. Right? Well, how much are they going to cut or not? And the speed of which they do it. And the market's trying to figure that out. But from a chart perspective, I think we can continue to bounce this. This doesn't look impulsive, right? Mm-hmm. It doesn't look like it's super powerful yet. It really just looks like, at least at this stage, more like a bear flag, right? It's just kind mm-hmm. of grinding higher, kind of push up a little bit. When you get up to a resistance level, maybe, like I said, that 430. And I'm thinking that that's about where it, it should stall out. The risk to the call is, is that it doesn't hold there, right? And it breaks out. But anyways, that's how I'm reading uh, the 10-year right now. And more importantly, the, the impact on the movement in interest rates, is not so much the S&P, but what is going on further down the market cap structure, you know, when you think mm. a little bit about the market, market of stocks. Yeah. So- you just brought up the Russell, right? Like if I can just just run with this for a second, Dave, like th- this, I, when I started uh, back in December, liked it, right? Telling clients it's okay, be long, small caps, we'll probably get up to the top of the range. Good, we got it. But then it was like, are we really going to be chasing this here? The, the, the rally was parabolic. So you think about Bob Farrell's saying, which was something to the effect of, you know, parabolic moves uh, don't correct sideways. I would argue that this move higher uh, from the end of last year was a bit parabolic for small caps. Mm. So even though small caps are down 9%, that is a lot. Don't get me wrong in percentage terms. It's only a one-third retracement of the move. So textbook technicals tell you you're allowed to give back one-third, if not two-thirds of the previous move before you, you reverse all the goodwill that was created. Guess where the 
Russell is trying to build support, at least today, at its 50-day moving average and right at those Fibonacci retracement levels. Mm. And if you even did even more geeky sort of Elliott ways of that, that structure that we have on, on the uh, – on the on the Russell is a very much an ABC type of pullback. It's not mm. impulsive, meaning it's a V top. It's one, two, three, and then again, it, this is about where it should stabilize. Go back one chart and take a look at where yields are. You are starting to get closer to overhead resistance. So base cases, we're probably getting close to at least a a snapback. I'm thinking that, uh, but overall, this seems to be par for the course. Good overbought condition. You create a consolidation phase. People got to reset expectations, and then we'll kind of take it from there. So I, what I see right now, Dave, even for the market of stocks, yeah, it's hairy, but I don't think it's enough to get too too bearish quite yet. But stay strong and stay confident. This was a lot of fun, John. I really appreciate you coming on, sharing some uh, charts with us. We were talking before we went uh, live about the CMT Association events coming up. I know I'm going to be at the Dubai event coming up in February. You're going down to Tampa uh, and I think appearing right. with one of our former colleagues, Mark Dibble. Tell us about the event That's and right. what you're going to be doing. Yeah, yeah. We're super excited about the, uh, the, the two events that are coming up at the CMT, right? Uh, on February 1st, we're going to be down in Tampa. Uh, I'll be presenting with Mark Dibble, a former colleague of ours. I would say legend in the business. We're going to have mm. a bit of a fireside chat. But what is uh, Craig Johnson's going to be there? We all know him. Fantastic. But what I think is going to be why I'm going, even though they asked me to speak, we're going to have Bob Farrell and Walter Diemer do a fireside chat at the end of it. And I think that's just oh. going to be just remarkable. I mean, I, I was so giddy when I when I met Bob Farrell at the right. 50th. Uh, a anniversary, I was like, you're like my Mick Jagger. And he's looking yeah. at me like, hey, are you, get away from me. And um, and he's going to be there. I get to see him twice in one year, basically. I'm super excited. And he's got Walter Diemer to boot to talk with him. So I, I, I'm super excited to, to, to go to that. And hopefully others will, 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 I'll see others down there. And then the Dubai one, which is on February 29th. Super excited about this one too. Why? Because the CMT, we're taking the, the symposium basically on the road. It's a world yeah. tour, essentially, right? We're going to Dubai. It's a big growth uh, market for, for technical analysis. John Bollinger's there, David Cox, Julius DeKemper, Dave Lundgren, fellow Boston guy, even Frank Teixeira, another fellow Boston guy. Gina Martin-Adams from Bloomberg will be there. Matt Verdo. And this guy, David Keller, is going to be there also. So <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's going to be I think it's going to be a great conference. I'm jealous you're going. I can't. Uh, my boss, the wife, said I have to pick one or the other, and uh, this time around, I, I chose I chose Tampa. Uh, but um, but yeah, I hope I hope you have a great time, Dave. Two fantastic events. Safe travels down to Florida. I wish you well at that event, and we'll uh, we'll be thinking of you in Dubai for sure. But for now, John, thank you. Pleasure to see you again. Miss working with you, you, but uh, but I hope we can do this again sometime. Absolutely. Thanks, Dave. That's John Kolovis. John's the Chief Technical Strategist at Macro Risk Advisors. He mentioned that event in Tampa. Those of you that are uh, in the U.S., I encourage you to check that out. Walter Diemer ran the technical research effort at Putnam in the 1970s and 80s. Um, Bob Farrell, legendary technical analyst who pioneered the Merrill Lynch legendary technical team in, in its heyday. So really good opportunity to learn from some of the real masters in the business. So special thank you to there from uh, John Kolovis at Macro Risk Advisors coming to us from Boston. All right, let's go right to the three in three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here is chart number one. We're looking at sector returns just over the last three months. And I came up with this because I was using our performance report. And if you have a list of charts, you can look at that in a performance view. If you're looking at a, at a chart list up in the upper right where it says view list as, go down to performance. It's a fantastic Simple tabular view of a group of stocks or ETFs or indexes, but allows you to look at different time frames. And I was looking at the last three months because that's basically just before the October low of last year. I wanted to see what sectors had outperformed the S&P. Only four of the 11 S&P sectors have outperformed the S&P over the last three months. In order, that's technology. And as of just today, overtaking real estate for that top spot. In the last three months, the XLK technology is up just under 17%. Real estate's number two, still up about 15% over the last three months. Financials and industrials rounding out that top four uh, group of sectors, all outperforming the S&P, which is up just over 11% uh, for the last three months. That performance tab can be really helpful for helping you understand which sectors are performing better or worse 
than a benchmark. And in any list of, list of stocks or ETFs, it can let you find the opportunities. I'm interested to see technology finally overtake real estate. I'm very interested to see how real estate has dominated on, our, on a relative basis. It's just a very strong uh, performance. But in 2024, here in the first couple of weeks of January, look at REITs have come down quite a bit while technology has thrived. You're certainly seeing flows into those mega cap growth sectors like technology, like communication services. Uh, these are the metas and NVIDIAs and other types of, uh, of names like that. In general, as a trend follower, I'm all for following strength, and that is where the strength has been so far here in recent weeks. But uh, looking over the last three months, a lot of opportunities that, that could be there. Chart number two, this is called the chart. This is something I've, uh, I always have updated on my Mindful Investor Live chart list, which I showed you earlier in the episode. This just combines some of the key measures of trend, breadth, and momentum that I like to follow. The S&P 500, of course, doing quite well off of the October 23 low, but sort of sideways here over the last three or four weeks. The advanced decline line on the New York Stock Exchange looked very bullish at the end of uh, December. Reminds me of the chart of, uh, of small caps, which John Kolovis, today's guest, uh, highlighted. Both small caps and the advanced decline line on the S uh, NYSE have pulled back. So now I think you're seeing a bit of a retrenchment, some, some of those strong indications that we saw at the end of December. The percent of stocks above their 50-day has now gone down, gone down to around 70%, and that sort of pullback is similar to previous sort of short-term tops. The bullish percent index has gone back below the 70% level. And again, look back on the chart, and you'll find that these indicators being very bullish and then coming out of those extreme ranges often indicate a significant top. Now, also notice this bottom series, which is offense over defense. Earlier this week, I talked with Adam Turnquist of LPL Financial. Make sure you go back to that episode if you missed it. We talked about how the fact that offense is still outpacing defense tells you things are not that bad yet. Keep an eye on those series to see if we get a further retracement. Finally, strength tends to beget further strength. I mentioned our market recap, monolithic power systems, MPWR, which is one of the uh, semiconductor stocks, uh, members of the SMH, uh, which is the ETF that I'm showing you here chart of the SMH is strong. I would think of SMH, uh, the semiconductor space, less as an offensive play, although it certainly has those characteristics. I think of it more of as a defensive play, right? Traditionally, something like utilities does well because it's a staple product, right? No matter what happens in the economy, no matter what happens with interest rates, you're still probably going to want to heat your house and, uh, and pay for cable and those sorts of things. Maybe you lighten up where you can, but there are basic things like shelter and food, which you're going to want to pay money for. And that's where those defensive sectors tend to be good places to, uh, to look. I would argue that semiconductors are kind of a modern day utility, right? You're still going to have a cell phone, probably. You're still going to pay for things uh, in terms of connectivity because it's so central to how we function now. So semiconductors holding up quite well. I don't know if that's necessarily a bullish sign for the markets as a whole, but it certainly tells you it could be an interesting way to ride out a period of market uncertainty like we're experiencing here in January of 2024. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. I want to thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. A special thank you to John Clovis of Macro Risk Advisors joining us from Boston. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel while you're here. We're almost to 100,000 subscribers. What an awesome milestone to get to. For Stock Charts in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a good night.